Yeah, my thoughts exactly. All right, we ready for our study? Man, I'm loud. Father, we give you much praise for your own beloved son. Thank you that you withheld the wrath that we deserve and gave us grace and life through Christ. Be with us now as we study your truth. Help us to understand it. Help us to be convicted by it and to implement it into our lives, to walk in righteousness, to mirror our God who is all wise, loving and gracious like you looked at last week. He is good, he's merciful, and he's long-suffering. Teach us what that looks like as true leather on it in our own lives. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. As we continue our study on God's attributes, especially his communicable ones, which means that in one way, shape, or form, these are some expectations in the believer's life as well through the power of the Spirit. We ended last week talking about the grace of God, and we'd like to continue thinking about certain attributes of God that are expected to be emulated by his creatures. We want to take a few terms that are used often and through our Bible study, flesh them out a little. His mercy, his goodness, and if we have time, how he is long-suffering. All these attributes find their source in God. They're not tacked onto him, but they are part of his essence. They, come out, they flow out of who God himself is. So tonight, as we continue to unpack God's glorious attributes, um, let me remind you what Spurgeon stated. He said, he who notices God's mercy will never be without a mercy to notice. So how tuned are you into recognizing God's mercy in life? I've been was sharing with one of two brothers or sisters this week. Um, as one who's been in the ministry for 30 years, a uh, passage of Paul that was in, really instructive to me. When Paul's writing to his protege, Timothy, and he tells this young minister that God mercied me putting me in the ministry. Now, Paul was known as a killer of Christians. It would have been enough that God saved his sin-sick soul. And God throws the icing on the cake that you get the privilege, the mercy of ministry. Uh, we need a whole lot of that kind of perspective in life of God's, God's mercy, that uh, where he is withholding what we deserve, and then he gives us grace, that which we don't deserve. So as we begin thinking about his mercy, the psalmist says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, verse 1. Other terms used in this regard is God's compassion, his pity, his loving kindness, or hesed in the, in the Hebrew. Since I mentioned one psalm, Psalm 103 and verse number 8 Psalm 103, verse 8, Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Over in Luke, Luke 1, we've got Mary's song, and Luke 1, verse 50 Back in verse 46, she said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has looked upon the humble state of his slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. 
again, going back to what Spurgeon told us at the beginning of our lesson tonight, that he who notices God's mercy will never be without a mercy to be noticed. And Mary was noticing mercy upon mercy in her life. By definition, when we are talking about the mercy of God, we are talking about God's goodness manifested towards those who are in misery or distress. We've factored into our biblical and Christian worldview that life in a fallen, sinful, broken world is to no trouble. Remember how Job says that Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. We understand trouble. We understand a great need for mercy. And so you understand the, the benefit of studying about the mercy of God. We understand mercy, uh, misery, excuse me. We need mercy. As we use goodness in the definition, we'll circle back around to that attribute in just a moment. To his goodness but we are thinking about his mercy. Mercy describes God as perfectly having deep compassion for people such that he demonstrates benevolent goodness to those in a pitiable or miserable condition even though they do not deserve it. This definition comes from some of the terms used in the original language. Mercy in Hebrew, rak hamem, and from the Greek, Elios, as with grace, this perfection does not consider the merit or lack thereof of the recipient. So when God bestows grace on us who deserve wrath, he shows us mercy, even though we do not deserve mercy. This is a... Uh, an attribute or a perfection of God. Go back to the Pentateuch with me, to Exodus, if you would. Exodus 34. This is a familiar account where we're going to visit with Moses for a moment. Exodus 34, beginning in verse number 1. Exodus 34, 1. Now Yahweh said to Moses, Carve out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be prepared by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself here to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of the mountain. So he carved out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as Yahweh had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. Then Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him. And he called upon the name of Yahweh. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. One of the things I've mentioned about these attributes is that there's, there's some spillover of one attribute to the other. That's why we used goodness in our definition for uh, defining his, his mercy. So, Notice the second bullet point. This mercy is manifold. It's multifaceted. Go over to Nehemiah, if you would. Nehemiah chapter 9. One of your references there. Over in Nehemiah 9, beginning in verse number 16. But they are our father, they are fathers acted presumptuously. Now think for a moment. He's recalling what it was like in the wilderness wanderings. And these were obedient saints? Not at all. Uh, he says that in verse 16, they became stiff-necked 
and would not listen to your commandments. So are they deserving of mercy for their disobedience? Not at all. Verse 17, they refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you did among them. So they became stiff-necked and gave themselves a chief to return to their slavery in Egypt. And in contrast, he says, but you are a God of lavish forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Now again, let's just think about the reality of our experience as humans. Somebody wrongs us, we want to return kind for kind. Give me a pound of flesh. I'm going to make you pay. You stepped on my toes. That's not how God responded to stiff-necked and disobedient Israel. Now, if you were to keep on flipping, you go past Psalms and Proverbs, go past Ecclesiastes, go past that major prophet Isaiah, past Jeremiah, Jeremiah known as the weeping prophet, who penned the next book after Jeremiah, the book of Lamentation. He's lamenting. And in the midst of the grief and the decimation and a disquieted soul, Lamentation 3, verse number 22, it's not all doom and gloom. God's not off the throne. You wake up in the morning, you're in an upright condition, you're reminded, I guess the Lord's got something for me to do. We're told in Lamentations 3.22, the loving kindnesses of Yahweh indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail, they're new every morning, great is your faithfulness. This mercy of God is something of his paternal affection and his care. Now go back to the Psalms with me if you would. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And uh, forget about verse 12 that I gave you. That's going to be included, but we're going back to verse 6. Psalm 103, 6. And again, lest you think that you're reading about the uh, history of a different kind of saint than the saints that are here this evening, these are the same kind of saints as what we are. Psalm 106.3, or 10, actually I'm, I'm in 106, I'm supposed to be 103.6. Psalm 103.6. Yahweh performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always contend with us. He will not keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. And he has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When God removes our sin, as far as the east is from the west, we're also told elsewhere by Isaiah that he remembers them, what, no more. How do we interpret that? It's not that God's got a bad memory. We've already talked about the wisdom of God, the omniscience of God. It has to be interpreted consistent with all the other texts of Scripture where God chooses as an act of His sovereign will not to hold them against us. I think I've told some of you before, I think the best definition I've ever heard of forgiveness is that forgiveness is a promise of pardon. God promises us pardon. 
because the finished work of Jesus, he does not deal with us as our sins deserve, but according to his mercy and his grace. This is his paternal affection and care. He deals with us as adopted children, our father. He's a father to his children. He's a shepherd to his sheep. Aren't you glad that he doesn't deal with us as our sins deserve, but according to his grace and his mercy? Not based on merit or demerit. Again, we'll use the scriptures to define what those aspects of mercy are. He gives mercy to all creation, believers, unbelievers alike. He gives to all life and breath, all things. His tender mercies are over all his works. Remember how last week we talked about, in regards to his grace, we talked about this category called common grace. When we read that the rains fall upon the just and the unjust, God doesn't just give grace to believers. He, unbelievers experience this grace. Even by having the church in the world as salt and light, you think this world is bad? Think about what it's going to be like when the restrainer is taken out and the church goes to heaven and you don't have that salty effect holding back the corruption of this world. God's common grace. Well, even the mercy displayed in this life are confined to this life alone. They're not going to follow past, past the grave. You know, over in Isaiah 27 and verse 11, if you want a chapter and verse for such a statement as that. Isaiah 27, 11, When its limbs are dry, they're broken off. Women come and light a fire with them, for they are not a people of discernment. Therefore, their maker will not have compassion on them, and their creator will not be gracious to them. So think with me through some of the manifestations of God's mercy. I, I, see how many I got on my list. I'm not going to find that one. Is it? Spiraling. There we go. Physical deliverance. Now, I'm not going to turn us to Philippians 2.27. That's just one reference. It's a, it's a text where Paul uh, teaches us, Epaphras was sick unto death, but God had mercy. Now, we don't impose upon God's grace and mercy, but at times, um, you know, Epaphras is the one that's been on my heart. We got a dear brother. We didn't know how his surgery was going to go on Monday. And I was jumping for joy that God saw fit to see our brother through surgery and give us, Lord willing, a few more years. There's no Epaphras, but another one that has experienced God's mercy. Physical deliverance from time to time. When you look at your salvation in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. Ephesians 2, us who were dead in our transgressions and sins. Verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Notice, again, grace and mercy working together. <coughs> Forgiveness of sins. Should David have been cast off altogether due to his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah? His sin against the nation as her king. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Psalm 51.1 How about election? In uh, Romans 9, Paul says that he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. 
salvation of the Gentiles, Romans 11. He gives mercy by providing salvation in all its aspects, including sustenance in the Christian life and final salvation at, at Christ's return. Well, the psalmist isn't done telling us about the lavish riches of his manifold mercies that transcend our loftiest thoughts. He says, your mercy is great unto the heavens. Psalm 57, 10. As the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. It's a mercy that made us alive. It's his mercy that saves us. It's his mercy that begat us to an eternal inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 3. To us who are the redeemed, he truly is the father of mercy, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. So, let me give you a little handle of application here. Ask yourself questions to determine how your walk of conformity to Christ's image is coming. For instance, how grace-filled am I? Does it show in my interaction and speech with others, with my spouse, with my kids, with my brothers and sisters in Christ, with my co-workers? Oh, and while I'm asking about how grace-filled I am, how merciful am I? Am I mirroring the mercy of God that I have received as I dole it out to others? You know, I've stated before and will continue to proclaim that you're, you're no more like your father than when you forgive. We're mo no more like him than when we're showing mercy as he has showered upon us. So that just kind of uh, gives us the tip of the iceberg in regards to God's mercy. How about his goodness? I think our computer's probably hung up right now. Um, there you go. His goodness. His goodness is that perfection which prompts him to deal kindly and bounteously with all his creatures. According to Grudem, God is the final standard of good and that, that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. In MacArthur Mayhew's Bible doctrines, they put it this way, that he is the perfect sum, the source, the standard for himself and creatures of that which is wholesome, virtuous, beneficial, and beautiful. In the Sermon on the Mount, which takes up Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is schooling the scribes and the Pharisees who think, you know what? We've arrived. He says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is. That's God's standard. Well, there's only one right answer. No way, Jose, right? Uh, I can't get there. The religious hoopla of the day We're too big to get saved. Too good to bow down and receive the righteousness which is alien to them and be clothed with Christ's perfection. All creatures in Scripture are called to, to praise His goodness. Run back to the Psalms with me if you would. Psalm 106. Psalm 106, in verse number 1. Praise Yah. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. Go to the next chapter. Psalm 107, 1. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. 118, verse 1. Give thanks to Yahweh, for He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. 
Psalm 136. Lest you miss it. Verse 1. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. We never run out of the goodness of God to give thanks for. And so, people, saints of Old Testament, saints of the New Covenant, are urged to trust in the Lord and to discover that he is good. Back in Psalm 34, verse 8, this has got to be one of our, our favorite psalms, the whole chapter is just dripping with the goodness of God. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Not refuge in another, not refuge in a substance, not refuge in another thing, but refuge in one person, him. You know, I was talking with a brother yesterday that I think there's a way in which we evaluate troublesome situations in life in our minds, in our thoughts, where we question His goodness. So this is not an exterior demonstrable sin of deed, but a sin of thought. How are we prone to being jaded in the issues of life, wondering... When's the other shoe going to drop in life or ministry or work or family? Because I just feel like we're overdue for something bad to happen. Too much good has been going on. You know, when's the next friend going to turn on me? This is sin and thought by castigating the goodness of God who works all things together for good. The goodness that he himself determines it to be. Let, let's run over to James 1 real quick. James 1. As we contemplate the sovereign goodness of God, because our default setting, if we're not careful is towards the bad and the negative, not the good. And we need to preach this sovereign goodness of God to ourselves time and again so that it become our default setting in Christ. James 1 and verse number 17, we are told that every good thing, how many good things? Every good thing given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. I think I may have mentioned from the pulpit before that when I was coming to affirm and understand the doctrines of God's sovereign grace, and like I was wanting to be accurate with my prayers of owning up of my responsibility, and then thanking God for His intervention in my prayers, but I didn't want to Thank God for something that He didn't do if it's something that I brought about. And yet James tells us, if it's something that's good, where did it find its source? In the character and the very person of God. He is the source of all our blessings. He's the highest good, the proper goal of all who strive for true goodness. That's why we anchor into His mercy and anchor into His changeless goodness. A.W. Pink, in his Attributes of God, said the goodness of God is seen in that when man transgressed the law of his creator, a dispensation of unmixed wrath did not at once commence. Well might God have deprived his fallen creatures of every blessing, every comfort, every pleasure. And instead, he ushered in a regime of mixed nature of mercy and judgment. This is very wonderful if it be duly considered and the more thoroughly that regime be examined, the more it will appear that mercy rejoiceth against judgment, James 2.13. Notwithstanding all the evils which attend our fallen state, the balance of good greatly preponderates. 
With comparatively rare exceptions, men and women experience far greater numbers of days of health than they do of sickness and pain. There's much more creature happiness than creature misery in the world. Even our sorrows admit of considerable alleviation, and God has given to the human mind a paleability which adapts itself to circumstances and makes the most of them. Pink goes on to quote the beloved Spurgeon when he says, we must never tolerate an instant unbelief as to the goodness of the Lord. Whatever else may be questioned, this is absolutely certain that Jehovah is good. His dispensations may vary, but his nature is always the same. And that applies to every one of his attributes, even his goodness. You know, every providence of God is designed for good. Trusted in prayer, he will give what is good. Experienced more fully by the obedient. Even in punishment, our good is the goal. When God takes us to the woodshed, Hebrews 12, 10, he does it for our good. It should result in praise in all situations. He is our greatest pursuit, our highest good, and it ought to be reflected in our relationships, that as he is good, he expects this goodness to characterize his children's lives as well. Your God is patient. I guess I skipped the, I skipped the slide. Well, wherever, oh, I got my notes out of, that's what I did. Got my notes out of place. Let's uh, contemplate one more. God is long-suffering. Speaks of God being perfectly placid. You say, well, what's that? Well, that's your new word for the week. Okay? In other words, uh, he's calm. He's even-tempered in himself and towards sinners in spite of their continual disobedience and disregard for his warnings. In other words, he doesn't, God doesn't lose his temper. You ever been guilty of losing your temper? God acts calmly with proper affection according to his eternal sovereign plan. The tranquility implies not that he lacks affections, but rather that God's affections do not overwhelm him or cause him to act against his nature. You know, when we talk about God being long-suffering, he is long to breathe. There goes my stubble, stubborn, obstinate child again, right? And he doesn't go into this tirade and snuff us out. In other words, God is patient with those deserving divine punishment. It's shown to sinners now, especially through Jesus Christ. One more passage and we'll go into our prayer time. Let's go over to Romans 2 for a moment. Romans 2. Romans 2. Again, ignore verse 4 because we'll get there. Start in verse 2. Romans 2.2. 2. We know that the judgment of God rightfully falls upon those who practice such things. But do you presume this, O man, who passes judgment on those who practice such things as does the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that, that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? You know, as we looked at the grace of God last week and talked about common grace and God's mercy tonight, His goodness, His long-sufferingness. One more place in Pink's book. Pink says, The goodness of God is seen in the variety of natural pleasures which He's provided for His creatures. Now, as you 
run out of your list of what to thank God for in His, His goodness. God might have been pleased to satisfy our hunger without the food being pleasing to our palates. You know, God could have just given us those, uh, I just lost the name, uh, in the military, the, the packets of food. Uh, huh? MREs, yes. We could have a full life of MREs. Wouldn't that be great? Without having food pleasing to our palates, how his benevolence appears in the varied flavors which is given to meats and vegetables and fruit. God has not only given us senses, but also that which gratifies them. Yeah, even though the beautiful smell of the lilacs I was walking under the other day made me sneeze, it's a fragrant aroma. This too reveals his goodness. The earth might have been as fertile as it is without its surface being so delightfully variegated. Our physical lives could have been sustained without beautiful flowers to regale our eyes with their colors and our nostrils with their sweet perfumes. We might have walked the fields without our ears being saluted by the music of the birds. Whence then is this loveliness? This charm so freely diffused over the face of nature, verily, the tender mercies of the Lord are over all his work. Psalm 145, 9. Stay with me. God, there is so much revelation in Scripture about your person, that you are indeed loving, long-suffering, you are the standard of all goodness. And you're unchangingly merciful to those who deserve wrath. Cause us to meditate on these truths and to beg you in our prayers through your indwelling spirit to help us mirror some of these attributes to your praise and glory. We pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.